on this edition of Exposé, Deep Inside the Earth. The carbon monoxide levels were toxic. It didn't look like anybody could have lived through that. A cold reality. Somebody on that mine site up there that day could have saved Bud's life. He didn't have to die. As doubts rise to the surface. They don't have to die. That's what the reports show. That's what the record shows. Funding for Exposé has been provided by Upshur County, West Virginia. On the morning of Monday, January 2, 2006, families gathered here at the Sago Baptist Church after receiving the news. News the rest of the world was about to hear. 6.30 a.m. Eastern Time this morning, an explosion in a mine in West Virginia. 13, 13 miners, miners trapped by an explosion this, this morning. morning. There was an explosion at coal, a coal mine in, in West Virginia. Over the next two days, the story of the 13 trapped Sago miners would incite a frenzy of intense media attention, drawing reporters to this small hollow from around the country. Yes, Jim Laird, yes. And around the world. But as the media waited breathlessly to learn the miners' fate, one local reporter who'd spent 15 years covering coal mining had already turned his attention away from the unfolding drama. One of the things that I learned a long time ago was when you're caught up in one of these big kind of media frenzy stories um, and everybody else is zigging, if you really want a good story, the best thing to do is zag. Hey, it's Ken Ward. All right, how you doing? Ken Ward of the Charleston Gazette has won national renown for his reporting on the coal industry's impact on the environment and its safety record. He was prepared when he heard about Sago. I was home, and after I talked to people at the paper, I got on my computer and did what I always do when I hear there's a mining accident. This routine I go through to what I call kind of profiling the mine. This was a small mine. It had been owned by a company that went bankrupt, bought out by another company out of bankruptcy. And what that does is sets off a little alarm in my head that this is a marginal property that might have bad mining conditions that make it a safety challenge. And I found that this mine, on first blush, had an awful lot of safety violations for such a small operation. In fact, Ward learned that federal inspectors had documented more than 200 safety violations at the Sago mine over the previous two years, three times the national average. Ward's readers had that information on day two of the crisis. Meanwhile, hope for survivors was beginning to dim. They had taken air samples in the mine, the carbon monoxide levels were toxic, it didn't look like anybody could have lived through that. And so that's what we were all prepared for. People prayed for a miracle. And then... Breaking news tonight, 12 of the trapped West Virginia miners are alive. They're screaming, they're all alive. They announced they're it the they're all alive. But there had been a miscommunication. Rescue workers had found only one miner alive. The other 12 had died. One of them had spent 28 years working underground. We were having discussions about what we were going to do or say, you know, when we saw Dad. And, uh, I mean, I just I just couldn't believe it, you know, how, how your heart can be, uh, sink so low. And, and then you get news that they're alive and you're just ecstatic. And it's almost like... Your family member dies twice in the same day. I can't believe 
that this has happened to our family. Oh, I can't believe it. The tragic outcome of Sago made worldwide news for days. But back at the Charleston Gazette, Ken Ward kept zagging. Everybody else is focused on the miscommunication and gut-wrenching stories about the families. And I thought, oh, let's take this story someplace else. The coal industry just had its safest year on record. And all of a sudden, there's 12 people dead. And I wanted to unpack that problem and look at why that happened. The problem at Sega was not that the explosion killed these miners. The problem at Sega was that they didn't get the miners out before they died after the explosion. Ward wondered, could the miners have been saved? Sago is not a deep mine. It slopes gently downward only about 300 feet. But the tunnels are long, stretching roughly two miles back. On the morning of the accident, 12 miners were working the upper tier of an area known as Two Left. One miner was alone. Nearby was an area that had been sealed a month before. Natural methane gas had built up here. It was where the explosion occurred. The lone miner was killed almost immediately. The 12 others were trapped by a cloud of smoke and carbon monoxide from the explosion. Somewhere up in this area, they hit bad air. Um, so they did the only thing they thought they could. They went back and put some plastic curtain up to, to kind of barricade themselves off. With bad air encroaching on the barricade, the miners did as they had been trained to do. They waited to be rescued, but as the Gazette would report, there was a problem. They didn't have enough rescue teams there early on to, to go in there and get those miners out. It was not until 5.30 p.m. that first day, 11 hours after the miners were trapped, that the first trained rescuers went into the mine. Was this an isolated case, Ward wondered, or part of a pattern? He sought the answer trolling through several libraries as well as the Internet. He found a series of federal reports, some going back a decade, revealing a rescue system officials had known was broken. I was able to find a couple of fairly thick studies that the government had done, one of them based on a joint task force between the mine workers union and the coal industry, uh, in which everybody involved on all sides agreed, we really have a crisis here. We don't have enough rescue teams around the country. The ones we have are not well trained enough. They're not close enough to mines. They're not familiar with the mines they might have to go into. Ward's Gazette report on the rescue system failures soon went national. After we published it, the New York Times wrote an editorial saying, my God, why didn't anybody fix this? In the coal industry, the term disaster is defined starkly, an accident that kills at least five people. The Charleston Gazette has covered many mining disasters, but as the local paper of record, it also seeks to put them into a larger perspective. Now, in the wake of Sago, the paper's team would delve back into history to see what it could tell them about the present. Reporter Tara Tuckwiller. As I read about the disasters, and of course, everything that had happened at Sago is fresh in my mind, I noticed similarities over and over and over. I found the Siltex mine disaster in 1966. Disaster struck in the small mining town of Malco, West Virginia, at 9 o'clock this morning. The men are trapped in two left. There's been an explosion. Men tried to escape. They couldn't. Smoke and gas. They used a canvas curtain to make a barricade. The families find out they're alive. Everybody's happy. Hours later, the company spokesman reveals the truth. We found them, he said. They're all dead. And then you find out that, that it wasn't Sago. It was a mine disaster that happened 40 years before in Fayette County. The last six bodies were brought to the surface, wrapped in burlap. I mean, it's identical down to the name of the area yeah. they were in the mine, which is really, that. really strange that it would have that. It's kind of eerie. Digging deep into a story is a Charleston Gazette tradition. Journalism, they say, propelled by an informal policy known through the newsroom. The paper's motto is a policy of sustained outrage. We investigate, we keep on it, we dig until we find out what's really going on. Ken can carry sustained outrage longer than I think anybody. Ken is tenacious, he's stubborn, he's really hard to deal with sometimes, really hard to be his editor but he's about the most driven person that I've ever been around. 
Ward wouldn't let go of his questions about Sago. He turned his sights on the small federal agency tasked with protecting miners on the job, the Mine Safety and Health Administration, MSHA. MSHA's public line is... It's only, this For years, he had been reporting that MSHA had been loosening its enforcement of safety rules. Dave Lariski, a former coal executive, was appointed to head MSHA by President George W. Bush in 2001. Lariski's stated goal to reduce the burden of regulations on the coal industry. He compared his regulatory agenda to that of previous administrations. All I can say, he said, is trust me, it's significantly shorter. Under Lariski, the ranks of MSHA's safety inspectors fell by 190, a 9% reduction. And the agency abandoned a dozen proposals designed to strengthen mine safety laws. Laws Ward reported that might have saved the Sago miners. They start out with the mine rescue teams. The Clinton administration was working on a rule to require more mine rescue teams and better trained rescue teams. The Bush administration threw that out. Ward found that in its official withdrawal of the proposed rule in 2002, the agency wrote, we hope to increase the number and improve the quality of mine rescue teams available to assist miners in life-threatening emergencies. MSHA is withdrawing this item and plans to evaluate non-regulatory alternatives. Another proposed rule would have required more and better emergency oxygen devices, safety technology that investigators later found did not work properly at SAGO. MSHA abandoned that too. And after a 2001 mining disaster killed 13 men in Alabama, safety advocates encouraged MSHA to require coal companies to provide underground communication devices to miners. Davit McAteer, who headed MSHA under the Clinton administration, supported the effort. This is a text messaging system, and you receive the messages that are sent from the surface to you. It could be used in a case, of, for example, at Sago to say, escape way clear, exit clear. MSHA, Ward would report, would not make the messaging devices mandatory. If the Sago miners had had some sort of two-way wireless communications that would survive an explosion, they could have called or text messaged or emailed the, the surface and said, hey guys, you know, this is where we are, come get us. January 2006 tested the mettle of the Charleston Gazette staff. In the two weeks following Sago, the paper reported some 80 stories on the disaster and its aftermath. Then, another mine accident. This time, 50 miles south of Charleston, in Melville, West Virginia, at a mine called Aracoma Alma No. 1. Two men died in a fire fed by an improperly vented mine. In the space of two weeks, 14 miners had died at two different mines. We did not have the outcome that we had desired, that we were hoping for. Uh, we have uh, two brave miners who have perished. With the state reeling, Governor Joe Manchin pushed the legislature to enact new safety laws quickly. The new measures mandated communications devices for miners, more emergency breathing equipment, and they updated the rescue system. All issues Ken Ward had extensively reported on in the days after Sago. But the politicians' actions reminded him of a common saying in the coal fields. Safety laws are always written in miners' blood. The nature of coal mining is that miners die, and after miners die, politicians promise not to let it happen again. We put together this timeline, and you see it just happens over and over again, and it doesn't ever seem to stop the, the carnage. January 27, 1891, 109 die in an explosion at Mammoth Mine in Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania. 1891, Congress passes the first national mine safety Number law. 6, 1907, 362 die in 1910, in Congress created the Federal Bureau of Mines. 1947, 111 die in Congress responded by passing the first federal mine safety standards. 1968 was the Farmington disaster. 78 men died in an explosion at the Consol Number 9 Mine. Congress passed the Federal Coal Mine Health and Safety Act. 1976, 26 
six people died. congress passed the new federal surface mining control and reclamation act. and in nineteen eighty four, twenty seven people died in a fire at the wilbur mine in orangeville, utah. and then in two thousand and one, thirteen died in alabama. the secretary of labor, elaine chao, gave a speech saying, we're going to protect miners' lives in the future. and then two months later. two thousand and six was the sago mine explosion. twelve men died. what happens is we pass a bunch of laws, but then, well, we for, don't really get around to enforcing them. Nobody really notices because the reporters have gone away. A local beat reporter, Ken Ward, would not go away. Now he wondered, could simply following the letter of the law save miners' lives? For years, he'd been collecting MSHA's coal mining accident reports. Thanks. You have a great day. You too. Thank you. Now he decided to analyze the hundreds he had amassed. And I said, okay, let's look at the last decade and let's read all of those and let's see what they say. Let's look for trends. Ward built a database of coal miner deaths between 1996 and 2005. Each was listed by name, date, mine, and type of death. Kerry Holliday was knocked to the ground and covered with about three feet of coal. He could not be revived. Richard Hughes was a, a fall of rock. Brandon Wilder, 23, killed in a roof fall. Alone. Each report described a tragedy. Together, they amounted to an indictment of an industry's safety record. Mine roofs not supported, electrical equipment not grounded, even simple first aid not taught. You know, the, this, this column right here, answer, was really the bottom line of what I was looking for. And that, I, I called it answer because that was the answer to my question. And my question was, was that death avoidable? And if it was caused by the company not following a rule or uh, ignoring some safety practice, then I would say yes, it could have been avoided. Nine out of ten could have been avoided. Ward's answers were a revelation. They don't have to die. That's what the reports show. That's what the record shows. But Ken Ward's 10-year database of coal miner deaths revealed something more, something that might help explain why mines were never quite as safe as they could or should be. It showed that most miners who die on the job don't die in the disasters that make national headlines and lead to new laws. Rather, they die alone, without much notice. The most frequent way that coal miners die is from a roof fall. I mean, it kind of stands to reason, you know, you're mining out the stuff that holds up the roof you're working under, and roof falls are going to happen. But most of the time when a roof fall happens, it's because the company wasn't following its approved roof control plan that's supposed to hold up the roof. Um, miners die very frequently by electrocution. Miners die by being hit by runaway mining equipment. Uh, Midland Trail Resources, uh, uh, this was a machinery accident in West Virginia in 2002. There's tremendous pressure on these guys to produce as much coal as they can, as quickly as they can, and shutting down equipment to repair it or making sure that the roof is adequately supported takes time, and time is money in the coal industry. Box after box, file after file, and death after death. Ten months after Sago, Ken Ward published a story that told of over 300 coal miners' lives and deaths. It was called One by One. And, and if we keep doing enough of those stories over and over again, um, uh, even if they're not all front page stories, but if they're, they're stories instead of little tiny cop briefs that nobody reads, you know, maybe it will, it will get enough attention going and enough uh, push policymakers to do something about it. One account stood out, that of a miner named Bud Morris. He died in Harlan County, Kentucky, just three days before the 12 miners died at Sago. Ken Ward visited Stella Morris eight months after she had become a coal miner's widow. We were both 29 at the time that he died. We had been together for two years before he passed away. This one was our Christmas photo about two weeks before he passed away. This was a picture taken of Bud on Thanksgiving the year before he died. Bud Morris died because another guy in his mind was operating a piece of equipment that had been kind of jury-rigged so that it could carry more coal, and that guy then therefore couldn't see where he was going. He ran into Bud, crushed Bud between two pieces of mining equipment, and cut Bud's leg off. 
nobody in that mine was trained to put a tourniquet on him. And that really stuck out to me because it, was, it so clearly was a death that didn't have to be. Emsha later found that the coal hauler that hit Bud Morris was loaded higher than was safe. And the agency cited the mine owner for failing to provide basic first aid. He went 55 minutes without any treatment. And him, you know, pouring the blood, of course, you know, he's not, that's, that's, hard, to, that's hard to swallow. The accident didn't have to kill him. This mine's coming up on your left is the old H&D mine and where Bud died. They operated here probably about a year, right here, about a year after. Um, it's just kind of hard to be here, knowing what happened up there. Something I really appreciated out of Ken Ward was the fact that he's been about the only one that's really done a, a full covered job on Bud's death. You know, as far as it being the one minor. You know, some people say that he might have said too much as far as Bud's accident and as far as Bud's injuries. But I was okay with him talking about the injuries. One leg was completely crushed and they said only tissue was holding it on and the other leg was cut completely off. And just the fact that the reason I talk about that is so people know that these accidents can happen. Simple first aid, their safety training, if they would take it more serious than what they take it today, somebody on that mine site up there that day could have saved Bud's life. He didn't have to die. You know, they consider five miners dying a tragedy. Our family considers one miner dying a tragedy. It, it fit the story I was trying to tell so well because, you know, you had January 2nd and the Sago mine blows up and all of a sudden people care about coal mine safety again. And just two days, three days before that, Bud Morris was killed and nobody paid any attention. But he died the way that lots of miners do because somebody didn't follow a rule and didn't make sure that his workplace was safe. We have not invented a new way to kill people in the minds of this country. We're doing the same old thing to the same old people over and over and over again. One of the things that the series that Ken wrote struck me was that the names of the victims were the same names of the victims 20 years ago. These same kind of families, these mountain names, and you know, we can produce all the coal you want, all the minerals you want, and not kill people in the process if we pay attention and follow the rules. The Sago mine disaster of January 2006 came and went for most media outlets, but not the Charleston Gazette. It continues reporting beyond Sago, including accounts of survivors fighting for better mine safety. Stella Morris has fought for and won safety laws in Kentucky, including six hours of specialized safety training for foremen each year. Sarah Bailey and her mother, Debbie Hamner, have become advocates for more forceful federal regulation, testifying before congressional panels on mine safety. The, the coal companies, uh, in this country, along with MSHA, are two wings of the same bird. The way I look at it, they're not effective in what they were established to do, and that's, and that's protect our nation's coal miners. I want to see the laws enforced. You know, there's a lot of young miners out there, and, and I just, I don't want to see this happen to them. I don't want to see any other families go through, you know, what we went through. Like Sarah and I will be out shopping and, and, and we'll be coming home and it just seems like she's going to be there when you get home. Mind safety is something that 
the paper is going to continue to have an express sustained outrage over. I would prefer not ever to have to do a story about a coal miner dying on the job. I'd like to not have to interview any more families, but it's, it's hard to have a lot of hope and think that that's going to happen. Funding for Expose has been provided by